Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Main Street Finance Podcast. I am, of course, Alex, your host, and this week I have another interview for you. Today, we have Rob Frasca. He is a serial entrepreneur, investor, and frequent speaker on blockchain and all things crypto. Rob, thank you for joining us. That's great to be here, Alex. Oh, I'm glad to have you. Now, I know I just kind of gave a little five-second overview of what you do, but would you mind going into a little bit more of just your background and what it is you do? Yeah. So look, I've been building companies. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been building companies now for, geez, almost uh, 30 years. I used to fly jets for the Navy back in the day, Desert Storm. And then uh, I started one of the very first financial services on the internet uh, way back in 1993. And that company was acquired by Intuit uh, when I was 29 years old, back in the 90s. And uh, we were the first stock quote server, the first mutual fund site on the internet. This is just pre-Netscape, <laughs> pre-Yahoo, crazy days. One of the original websites. One of the original websites. That's that's <laughs> right. That's right. And uh I uh, worked for Intuit for a while, and then I did another company uh, with my current CTO at Cosmo Ventures, and it was an artificial intelligence uh, company, one of the first ones, and we sold that to Lycos, which uh, most people don't even remember Lycos. They were right behind Yahoo, the number two portal in the world. And then I did a bunch of other companies. I sold one to uh, to Nielsen and another one to uh, to Unity. So I've been building companies for a while. And now I run a venture fund called Cosmo X, uh, named after Cosmo Medici, uh, who uh, was basically invented banking as we know it. And I'm really uh, spending a lot of time investing in uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency and all the great stuff that's happening out there uh, in the world. See, which is a fantastic thing, because honestly, uh... For those listeners that are on my Twitter account, I've only just sort of uh, come around to crypto. Uh, I've always been one of those, it's it's nothing, it doesn't exist. It's Monopoly money or Chuck E. Cheese tokens. That <laughs> It's Chuck E. Cheese tokens that just because other people value it doesn't necessarily give it value. But then again, it's just because people value the US dollar that makes it able to be spent. So I've sort of come around on my thinking a little bit uh, recently. Even then, I still have just my toe in the water. So I'm really glad to have you on the show here, Rob, because honestly, this is one of those topics where I'll be learning probably at the same pace as my listeners here today. So I'm very glad to have you here. Yeah, no, it's great to be here. Look, this is, I, I you know, I've been uh, doing Cosmo Ventures now for, shoot, almost eight years, seven and a half years. Uh, my partner, Kiran Hines, and I started it. And we've been in kind of looking at blockchain and crypto now for almost five years. And I always say uh, to my partners and a lot of people I know, I said, man, I have seen this movie before. And I, in fact, I've been in this movie before uh, as an entrepreneur and I know how it's going to end. And one of the things that I always say with respect to blockchain is, and, and I truly believe this, this is the single largest value creation event in our lifetime. And I was fortunate to, you know, build a lot of value in dot com. Uh, and this this is bigger than the internet itself. And so, you know, I'm 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 thrilled to uh to tell you more about why I believe that and all the great things that's going on out there. Cause this is as an investor, this is a serious alpha generating uh, event <laughs> out there. And you, you cannot, you got to pay attention to this. If you're an investor, you got to pay attention. Yeah, at this point, it's, I mean, if forget too big to fail, it's too big to ignore. I mean, <laughs> go. going back to your comment on single biggest value creation. I mean, honestly, I'm not even going to try to disprove that. I mean, we went from... Uh, well, what was the famous thing? Like in 2011, someone spent like 200,000 Bitcoins to buy a pizza. And now all of a sudden, <laughs> I remember looking that up. It was like the first purchase recorded or that we know of was like 200,000 Bitcoin to 200,000 individual Bitcoins, which are today worth, what, $50,000, something like that. Uh, well, one Bitcoin, <laughs> yeah, is worth $50,000. So, you know, that was an expensive pizza. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it was like a six hundred million dollar pizza to, in today's terms, something like that. Yeah. So, so we went from that to what total cryptocurrencies like what two trillion dollars now, something yeah. like that. Yeah, and I and I think it's look, I think it's still early. I think it's uh, still the first inning. 
you know, one of the one of the things a lot of people say to me, well, what is this blockchain thing and what what's really going on here? And, you know, when you think about the Internet, right, the Internet was built uh, essentially to to create a communication network that would survive a nuclear attack. Most people don't realize that. So so the idea was, is that if I could create a decentralized network and let's say Boston was bombed, uh, it still should work. And the first phase of the internet was really about creating technologies that allowed content creators to essentially, you know, distribute their content, right? You know, when I grew up, I'm in my fifties. When I grew up, we had four television stations, ABC, NBC, CBS, and PBS. I used to watch Mr. Rogers on PBS. And nowadays, right, we, we get our news everywhere because what the internet did was it, it basically made content media decentralized. And the second phase of the internet was really about the decentralization of communication. It used to be that you had one central telephone company and all calls went through that telephone company and that was it. And then all of a sudden the internet, what did it do? It, it, it de- completely decentralized. You and I are having in this podcast that we're having a conversation here, uh, you know, and it's basically free. It's the cost of the internet. And the third phase of the internet was really about kind of the decentralization of commerce. You know, as a kid, my mom would take me to Sears to buy my back to school clothes or to JC Penney uh, to buy, to buy stuff. Right now, one click button, I buy something from Amazon and it comes from around the world. It's completely decentralized, right? So every phase of the internet created new technologies, new companies, and it completely disrupted our world. And so what's the one thing that's still centralized? If you think about it, it's trust. It's kind of the financial transaction, the world of financial transactions. In the same way that we used to make all our phone calls go through Mom Bell and now they're networked, now what blockchain does is it allows us to basically clear the trade on the network. So, you know, think about it, Alex, if I, if I want to have a transaction with you and I give you $10 and you give me a, you know, piece of a painting and I don't know you and you don't know me, what do we do? We use a bank. Mm-hmm. We use a minerman, we use a broker, we use somebody that we trust, some central institution of trust to clear the trade. And that institution gets paid. They get a transaction fee. That's kind of how the world works, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's been doing that since the 1400s, right? With Medici and the Medici Bank. Now, all of a sudden, Bitcoin comes out with this thing called blockchain. And what it proves is, is instead of using one institution of trust to kind of clear the trade, I can use the whole network. I don't need one central institution. So now all of a sudden we're using networks instead of banks. We're using networks instead of brokers and, and all of these central institutions. So this is this is a big, big, big deal. Lots of lots and lots of value there. So we're pretty, you know, pretty excited about it. You, you can't ignore it. Absolutely not. And actually, that was actually going to be my first question is essentially like, what is blockchain? But that makes sense. Uh, would you mind going into a little bit more of like networks? I've only just started kind of understanding how all this works, but I imagine your explanation would be better than mine. Yeah. So let's go back into that. There's a book by uh, Niall Ferguson. It's, it's basically, uh, it's called The Tower in the Square. And what, what he talks about is, is that society is built on these towers of trust, these central institutions. So think of them like the tower and there's people in the tower, the bank is a tower, right? And what really happens is, is that there's a town square in front of the tower. And in that town square, there's all these people talking. There's people trading and people moving money around. If you really think about it, it's a network. It's a network of people in the town square. Now the tower is part of that town square, right? If you visualize it, okay? So what happens now with blockchain is, is instead of using the tower to say, hey, did did Rob give Alex $10 and did Alex give Rob a painting? Instead of adding one person, we ask everybody in the town square, hey, did Rob give Alex $10 and did Alex give me the, the painting? And do we all agree? Do we have consensus that that Rob did that? And oh, by the way, the money's digital. So let's make sure Rob didn't double spend it, make a copy of the money. And and let's make sure Alex didn't make a copy of the painting. 
and the painting is original and the money is transferred. And everybody in the town square, if you imagine, if everybody in the town square raised their hand and said, yep, that transaction occurred, then we could write that to the blockchain and voila, the transaction's cleared. So that's why the network is so important, right? If you think about it, the internet's a network. We're already on the network. We're all communicating on our network. Our phones are on the network. And so why not just clear the trade? Why don't we just clear the transaction on the network? And that's what's going on here. I got you. So the way I sort of think of it, which I think that completely makes sense, but I think I like to make it a little bit more uh, intense of an example. I like to think of the network as like a uh, Greek theater. Like if yep. you imagine the Greek amphitheaters, I mean, you had that one platform and then sort of stairs that go up and all these people watching. Essentially a trade through blockchain or any of the cryptocurrencies is like you and that person are standing on the stage and you're projecting like, you know, opera. Let me get back from the microphone for a second. Excuse me, my good sir. Let me give you these 10 coins and you give me this. I concur. That's exactly <laughs> what's going on. That's what's going on. And it's going on near instantaneous with technology. And so when you think about it, like, like when you have, again, let's go back to the internet, right? Why, why did the internet, why was it built to become a resilient network that would survive attack? Resiliency means that you, you'll survive, right? Mm -hmm. And so the problem is, is that we've got this in our entire world is networked in resilience, except what money. the value layer mm -hmm. money. <laughs> OK, the banks can print more money. Governments can devalue the money. You can you can hack a bank and steal the money. It's, and, and so we've got all this fraud and all these problems in our society because why? Because money is still centralized. So now all of a sudden blockchain and and it, by the way it's not just money it's it's any kind of contract are really central right trust mm -hmm. is central you know you're, you you go to the DMV to get your driver's license your credit score is held in a central server all that stuff is 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 really should be decentralized so this is that's why this is such a multi trillion dollar event because now what's happened is is that I think Bitcoin has kind of showed you that this stuff can work. And now you've got millions of entrepreneurs all saying, hey, I can use that same technology to do X or Y or Z and do it in a whole new resilient way. And that's why as investors, you go, okay, this is this is kind of internet, you know, 4.0 here in a big way. Oh, yeah. And I do want to hit just I just sort of uh, expand upon my point for a second here to really hit home why this decentralization is, I guess, at a minimum interesting and why it's yep. uh, fascinating is that like, going back to my theater example, and the, let's bring the DMV into it. If you're talking about a driver's license, is this driver's license valid? Are you able to drive? There's one person you can check with, and that's the DMV. Like if you get pulled over, they're checking the DMV. There's one institution, the DMV. Versus you go back to my example of the Greek theater, like you're doing this stuff in front of potentially thousands of people. And there is no, you know, hey, did he did I give that guy ten dollars? You've got an army of people who all saw that and can all raise their hand and say, yes, this 100 percent happened. That yep. is the network. That is validation. That's not, you know, you go to the DMV and it's like, oh, well, the DMV isn't answering my calls or they're taking forever or, right. you know, oh, I've been in the lobby for six hours and this is whatever. Or maybe there's potentially someone in the DMV doing something they're not supposed to. So the idea of decentralization, you go from this one person or this one organization that can validate things and make things true or false as they see fit versus a virtual army of people or computers, the network, whatever that can vouch for, yes, this thing happened. Yes, this thing is official. Yes, this thing isn't counterfeit. And with technology, you can have those thousands of people examine the thing, look at it and give it the thumbs up and, you know, a tenth of a second. That's exactly very, very well said. That's exactly it. Let, let me add a little more uh, fuel to this fire. And, and this is the reason why I'm so excited about this. I, you know, I'm so passionate about it. And let's just put out some data here. So more than 50% of the world's population does not have a bank account. Yep. Those 50% of the world are not really in the kind of financial ecosystem of 
the machine, of the world, of the economy. They're on the economy at the fringe, at, at the cash level. But here's another point. More than 75% of the world, and it depends on who you ask. I've seen numbers as high as 80. I've seen as numbers as low as 65, 69% have a mobile phone. In fact, the people that have a mobile phone, the bulk of the people that have mobile phone actually have them prepaid because mm-hmm. they because they don't they can't even have an account to get the phone. They have to prepay it, okay? Because they're in the cash society versus a bank society. But here's the thing with blockchain. All those people, that 75% of the world's population that have that phone, now they have a bank account. They can participate in yep. the world economy. They can get loans. They can, they can transfer money around the world instantaneously. They can buy things, move things. They, they can participate in contracts, all because they have that phone that's attached to them. That's, that's another. So when you, when you think about the size of the market, it's not just it's not just what you can do with the technology, but it's the new people you're bringing into the economy. Absolutely. And actually, that's something I could definitely bring up. So I don't know if we talked about this before we turned the mics on, but I'm actually a commercial credit analyst for a bank. So yeah. the the struggles of the unbanked is not something that is lost on me. And for those of you that don't really know what that is, and it's essentially that For every person that doesn't have access to the banking system, it's essentially a a drag on the economy because that's money that could be going to work doing something else. Say you have a city of a million people. Most of those million people are going to have bank accounts. They're going to be doing transactions. And what do banks do? They hold on to deposits and they loan it out. And those loans are typically for productive things you know, a factory to manufacture things, which gives people jobs, or a storefront, which sells things, which fills needs. So having that money being able to be lent out is a huge thing. Now, I just pulled up my calculator here and did some quick math. Say in your city of a million people, you've got 50,000 people that are unbanked. And let's say those 50,000 people who are unbanked because they don't have a lot of money, say they each only have like $200 at any one time, you know, they're just sitting on that 200 and it goes in and out. But on average, they're sitting on $200. That comes out to $10 million that sits outside of the banking system. And that $10 million, if you use fractional reserve banking, basically comes out to maybe $90 million of potential loans and economic growth. So it's not just that, oh, you know, we've got this many people who are who don't have access to the banking system that actively hurts us. So by having this sort of this avenue to where they can go from not being banks, not having anything, to now you can have a crypto exchange. Now you can have your finances on an app somewhere, and that can be much more productive and help the rest of us. That's right. That's right. So this is it's it's just a massive uh, it's a massive event. And look, look how you know most people uh, out there today can't imagine life without the internet. I grew up without life on the internet. I, like I told you, I was an entrepreneur that you know helped. Uh, you know, bring the internet to life and make it make it real. And just think about our life with it today. That's how we're going to be, you know, five to 10 years from now with blockchain, all these transactions, we're just going to say, geez, how how do we, what we used, we used a bank for that, or we used a broker for that? What? It it just, it's, that's, you know, that's why it's so important. So, you you know, you got to look at it as an investor and say, okay, uh, you know, this is an area that I have to understand because as an investor, I'm always seeking alpha, right? I'm looking for investment returns. And so that's, you know, as a venture capitalist, that's why we're looking at this space is because the, the returns are, you know, on a, you know, you just, you, you have to pay attention to it. Absolutely. So you bring up investments. I'm really glad you brought up that segue. So how exactly are we investing? Like, are we saying invest and not even we, you know, what, let's make it more specific. How are you investing? Are we do? are you doing NFTs? Are we talking buying into certain coins that you believe in? You've seen the right. white papers on, you think it's good stuff, or is it more the blockchain technology itself? And if the latter, what exactly besides finance, I guess, or what specifically could that blockchain really do? And I realize I just asked you 10 questions in a row, but yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it, it, it's it's all good. So there's there's a bunch of stuff packed in those in those questions. You know, a lot of people say to me, "Oh, Rob, I love blockchain. I want to invest in blockchain, but cryptocurrencies, you know, that just seems like magic magic money, or you know, like, like fake, you know, monopoly money." I think you used the term. Here's an important point. 
and I want to kind of share it. So as venture capitalists, what we do is we, we invest in either the companies that are being built through traditional mechanisms, right? You buy equity in those companies and you help those companies grow. And then when those companies become liquid, you make alpha, you make an investment return. And generally that takes a long time uh, and it takes a lot of money. Uh, and there's a lot of risk involved. And by the way, that, that's kind of analogous with the old model, which is if you're the tower, right? Let's go back to the tower and the square. If, if, you're, the, if you're the middleman, how, what's the business model? How does the bank get paid? They get a transaction fee, right? How's the broker get paid? They get a transaction fee. And it's pretty easy, right? Because there's only one of them. So basically you clear the trade, you get paid to clear the trade, right? Right. What if it's a network? How's the business model work? If I just asked everybody in the on the network to clear the trade, how do I pay them? And who gets paid? And who gets paid? And why? And what happens if somebody on the network does something wrong? Do they get penalized? So what what's going on here? How do I create a payment system to basically incentivize everybody on the network to basically behave? in the way that makes sense. And if they don't behave in the way that makes sense, how do we hurt them? So how do we benefit them if they're good people? And how do we hurt them if they're not? That's what cryptocurrency is. So what happens is, is that if I create a technology, which is really a network, and that network is really a trust network, that everybody who, who uses that network, right, should, if they are providing consensus, they should get paid. If they are, are, if right, and if they need consensus, if I'm on the network and I need you to prove to everybody that I, that everybody in the audience, if I yell out to your ample feeder, right, I'm in the mm -hmm. Greek ample feeder, and if I yell out to everybody, hey, I need you to clear my trade with Alex, I just gave him ten dollars, right? Then I should pay everybody in the audience something, right, mm -hmm. to say, yeah, Rob gave Alex that money, right? <laughs> I That's saw it, right? I saw it. <laughs> That's what cryptocurrency is. So that's why all these projects, all these technologies that are building new consensus networks all have a currency because it's this currency that's being used to reward people on that network. So you would imagine then that if I have a network and it's you and me, let's just say it's just you and me, we're on this network and... Uh, we add a person to that network. So now we got three people on the network. That network isn't that valuable. No. Right? Like we might be able to trade our Pokemon cards, okay, on that network, but it probably couldn't even do that. How much consensus could we have, right? I mean, you got valuable. one person. I mean, you're back you to centralization. That's right. It's centralized. Now, all of a sudden, what happens if the network's got 10 million people? That network becomes a lot more valuable. Mm -hmm. And so that's why these cryptocurrencies that's how you want to think about value. It's how many people are on the network. What's the value of the goods and services in the trust contracts that are being moved across that network? And what's the velocity and how fast is that network growing? And what, what, is, what kind of trust is it providing? And how resilient is it? That's why these currencies go up in value because what's happening is, is the size of the network is going up. And so that's how you want to think about it. So you asked, what do we invest in? I invest in equity for companies that are building some of this tech, but I also invest in the network itself. And the way we like to do it is we like to buy the actual currency, the tokens of that network. And uh, now we like to get in early. Like we like to get in <laughs> super, super early so that it's kind of like buying Bitcoin when it was 10, when it was 10 bucks. Now there's a lot of risk because Bitcoin might have never succeeded at $10. Mm -hmm. But, you know, our model is as venture capitalists is to kind of, you know, get in as early as we can. Absolutely. And then that's another part of venture capital. It's high risk, high reward. I mean, the kind of level, the kind of altitude that you guys look at this deal and forgive me if I'm putting words in your mouth here. It's like you can fund 10 projects. And if right. one of them more than 10 X's, which these projects, if they do well, they're likely going to do much more than 10 X. That's I mean, right. it's it's the shotgun approach, really. I and mean, if you back right. ten projects and one one hundred X's, I mean, heck, a ten that ten percent that you lost on those other nine, it's cost of doing business. That's right. But now remember, how do networks grow mathematically? They grow exponentially. Mm -hmm. All networks grow exponentially. 
it depends on what the exponent is, but they, by definition, they grow exponentially, right? Yeah. And so if value, if the value of, if, if the network grows exponentially and the value of the system is basically the size of the network and the throughput of the network, then the value is growing exponentially as well. And so that's why you're seeing such incredible growth rates on some of these uh, some of these projects is because by definition, it's a kind of analogous to the size of the network and how fast it's growing. Okay. Now I have a, I have a very weird question for you. Now it's a question that as I look more and more into blockchain, it comes up, but I've never really had the ability. I never wanted to ask somebody because a lot of the people I chat with are on Twitter and on Twitter, uh, you know, you type something, people might not think it's sarcasm <laughs> or people might not think, that you're being genuine. So sure. I'm being genuine with this question. Isn't cryptocurrency, if you look at it from a high level, is it not systemically almost like a pyramid scheme? Like not that it's a scam, but that going back to the network example, if the network's just me and you, the thing's basically worthless. So how you make it more valuable is you bring more people in. So the early adopters are almost incentivized to, hey, we need to get more people into this and we get essentially we get our money, we get our investment return by bringing more and more people in. If this cryptocurrency grows and grows and grows, we keep bringing people in, we keep pushing it. Wow, this coin is so awesome. Like y'all need to get in on this. Look how great our, you know, our networking system is as, as opposed to someone else's. Like there's a lot of inherent things to cryptocurrency and blockchain, at least to me, that looks kind of pyramid schemey. Again, not that it's a scam, but just that... Sure you get that exponential growth and these things take off by getting people in. Well, ultimately the network has to provide value, right? Otherwise, what's the point, right? So right. the network has to, you know, ultimately provide value. Ultimately, that's how it has to be evaluated. You know, the, the problem with any new technology is, is that, you know, some people do do nefarious things or, you know, crazy things you know, uh, with this stuff, but ultimately the network has to provide value. I think what's happened with crypto is that there are a, a variety of technologies and projects that ultimately provide real value. They're inventing new technologies, new protocols, new use cases, et cetera. And then there are others that are purely speculative and, uh, you know, when Elon Musk says, hey, this can, you know, th this is cool, uh, you know, the thing goes up, right? And when, and when people say this is ridiculous, it goes down and, and it's just kind of pure speculation. So I, I think as investors, you kind of have to look through that. You got to understand, you know, what it is that you're looking at and, and why you think it's going to be, you know, significant or why you think it's almost entertainment value. <laughs> Yeah, which some of it is. I mean, look at, I mean, I'd hate to name names, but uh, <clears throat> Dogecoin. Uh, <laughs> you said it, I didn't, right? I mean, look, I can say it because I can always claim ignorance. Because, I mean, look, I've said it several times on this episode already that, look, I'm right. fresh to this stuff. Like, I don't really, I, look, I'm going to tell, look, to the audience right now, I kind of know what I'm talking about. Uh, look, 90% of my episodes, 99%, I know exactly what I'm talking about, and I'm able to give good explanations. Yeah. Like, crypto is not one of those things. Right. <laughs> well, look, by definition, it's early, right? Only 10% yes. only of the world is in this market. I'm a big student, you know, my business degree from Carnegie Mellon, I'm, I'm, you know, which is a total bastion of geekery out in Pittsburgh <laughs> and you know, guys you know, just amazing. Right. And, and there's this theory. It's a, it, it's not really a theory. It's a, it's basically product diffusion theory, which basically says, why do people adopt products? Why do they buy them? And, and, and what does that cycle look like? And there are a lot of books written on it. Um, and basically, you, you, you know, you might've heard, right. So, you know, product generally starts by a visionary, a group of people that really have a vision for what this could be. And that's generally like 5% of the population. And then when that catches on, the early adopters jump in. And that's about 10% of the population. And so when you add the visionaries and the early adopters, it adds up to around 12 to 15% of the world population. And then what happens is if that technology really, or that product really takes off and it enters the mainstream majority or the early majority, 
that's about 40% of the population. If it can kind of cross the chasm and jump into that, that group of people, that's when the thing really takes off. And so this is how they basically model how, how products evolve and how they grow into the market. And by the way, this applies to everything from the telephone, to steel, to railroads, to refrigeration, every, every kind of new thing in the history of man has basically followed this approach. And so there's this kind of magic moment when it goes from the early adopter to the early majority, that's when you want to start investing in it. That's when you want to say, okay, this is real. I can really create, some, you know, generate some alpha at scale. And I would argue that blockchain is right at that point right now. So it's, it's still early. It's at that kind of one, you know, that, that kind of 12 to 15% market penetration worldwide. So with that, it's just like the early days of the internet. You know, there, there are a lot of wonky stuff that just doesn't make sense. And as the majority kind of runs in, uh, then things start really taking a, a better, better shape. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you think cryptocurrency has money and backing behind it now, I mean, imagine yeah. it blows up. I mean, if we're saying, you know, hypothetically, again, we're just kind of estimating if we're saying we're at 15 percent worldwide adoption right now. Imagine what happens when it looks like, hey, maybe we're going to get another 10 percent. Or That's maybe right. another 10% of the population. How many people are, you know, very smart, well-educated people who can really put some progress? How many of those people are sitting on the sidelines right now because, oh, that cryptocurrency stuff is going to blow over? How many of those people are going to see that, oh, maybe there's something here. Maybe I should start putting some effort in here. And they're the ones that are going to make the big sweeping changes that push it into you know, that 15% to 25 to 50% of the world actually using it. And how much will the value grow in that time period? That's right. That's right. I mean, look, to put it in perspective, I think the cryptocurrency market's what, $2.6 trillion right now. The global debt, okay, just the global debt as an asset class is $255 trillion, okay? You know, the global stock market, of all global stocks is 120. So uh, gold held for investment is around five trillion. So you know we're 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 uh, you know this is this is the first inning. Uh, this is this is tiny compared to you know all of these other numbers. Yeah, and debt is. It surprised me for a second there that debt was bigger than equities, but I can get it because you can't have. You can't have equity and say a government, but a government can have, you know, trillions of dollars of debt. So that makes sense. Right. That's yeah. that surprised me for a second there, just how much investment debt is more than stock market debt. But sorry, that the whole thing's a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there is one more question I really had for you, something that I don't quite understand. But since I have an expert here, I might as well ask. Um, could you explain what staking is? Because I know there is a lot of ads nowadays. Like you look at coinbase voyager any of those other kind of brokers for crypto there's always a hey you can earn five six seven i've seen nine percent by quote unquote staking sure. your cryptocurrency would you mind explaining kind of what that process is and how that helps the network yeah so when uh when blockchain first uh came out um with bitcoin and ethereum and many of the earlier protocols um, the way that uh, the way that they did consensus, meaning the way that they allowed everybody to vote and provide consensus was with this concept of mining, where you had to run these high speed computers, you still do, and you have to solve problems and burn a lot of electricity. I'm, I'm using a low tech uh, right. definition here, please. Highly appreciate it. Uh, the, the, you know, don't all the techies out there don't cringe. Okay. But with my, I'm just trying to simplify, highly keep it simple. And so the model is really called mining. And so what happens is, is you have a group of people that set up specialized computer hardware around the world to essentially provide consensus or trust. They're, they're the ones earning the the uh transaction the fee, fees the, the transaction fees so imagine for me to earn that transaction fee instead of a bank doing it i gotta spool up a computer high speed burn a lot of electricity and if i do it right i'll earn some transaction fees and that's proof of work proof of stake is different what proof of stake says is here's what we're gonna do i'm gonna allow you to earn 
transaction fees in the network if you put your money where your mouth is, okay? And I'm going to give you proportionally transaction fees by how much money you put to back your mouth. And what do I mean by your money where your mouth is? Well, let's say that I'm in the audience and I put $1,000 up, I stake, I put $1,000 up as collateral for my voting. What that says is, is that as long as I vote truthfully, and as long as I'm a good citizen, and I put $1,000 up, then I can earn transaction fees that are proportional to the amount that I put up as collateral. And if I do something wrong, let's say I lie, I, I say, you know, man, Alex, Alex really didn't, you know, Rob didn't really give Alex that $10 in that theater example, and I lie, then they could take my $1,000 away. They could slash it. So there's a penalty if I do something wrong or if I act uh, poorly. And so this staking concept is huge. All of these new networks now are moving to these proof of stake models. Because if you think about it, they're kind of like, they're very analogous to me putting money in a bank. You know, I put money in the bank and I get a yield. Here, I put money on the node and I stake that node. And the node is providing the consensus, the validation, the clearing of the trade, the transaction fee. And then I get a cut of it. So I can earn a lot of yield. I can get, and I, I hate to call it yield because it's not really like financial yield. It's more like a bonus. Mm -hmm. It's more like a fee. It's a transaction fee that you're getting paid back. And so that's what staking is. It's really uh, putting your money where your mouth is. And so if I go buy Casper, okay, Casper Labs, layer one, really cool protocol. We've invested in it. And I own that currency. Then if I want to run a node, I can then run a node, which means I can vote, I can clear the trades, and then I can stake that. I have to stake that node with what I own, and then I earn. Now, I might not be technically savvy enough to run my own node, so maybe I'll stake my, maybe I'll let you, Alex, you're technical savvy. I'll let you run the node, and because I know you, I'll, 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 put, I'll put money on your node because I trust you. I'll stake my uh, currency on my trust in you, Alex, to run that node. Okay, so is there a is there a risk that, you know, in your example, you know, you put your money on my node. Is there a risk there that you could potentially lose your money because, you yep. know, I feel a certain kind of way. And it's like, yep. you know what? That guy didn't get paid. And all of a yep. sudden you've lost your money. Bingo. Yes. I could uh, stake you, Alex, because I think you're a good guy and uh, you're not you're not doing anything wrong. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, you do something wrong and I'm I'm out. I could lose it. That's true. So you got to know who you're you got to know who you're staking. And if you don't know who you're staking, stake yourself, run a node yourself. Well, definitely some, uh, I tell you what, since you're saying that, I, I doubt we're going to be able to do a how-to manual here. Let me go ahead and ask you this. Do you have any good, say, books or resources that maybe I could put in the show notes for people who are more interested in blockchain, cryptocurrencies, um, staking? Like, is there any sort of, you know, crypto Bible? Like, hey, if you want to look at this stuff, these are the books you got to read. Oh, boy. Uh, not off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's all good. Uh, not off the top of my head. I mean, it, it's just such a fluid market. Uh, yeah. You know, there's just it's just it's just changing every you know every day, right? Uh, and so it's really uh, hard. I, I'll have to give a think on that, and maybe I can uh, maybe after this I can maybe pull some stuff together for your notes. Well, I tell you what, we're recording this. This is just for posterity. We're yeah. recording this in mid-December. I don't believe this episode's probably going to go out until early February. So yeah. if at any time you think of something, if you want to just shoot me an email sometime after the fact, yeah. uh, I'll probably record some... I'll probably record like a five minutes of me going, hey, quick thing, Rob got back to me and sent me that list. That stuff is going to be okay. in the description below. So if you're about to hear a sound effect and my voice cut in with that message, that's what's about to go down. All right, that works. I'll uh, I'll I'll take that as an assignment. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> Hello, gang. It's your host with the most with a new microphone, actually, that I'm having fun with. So now that you're hearing this mixed in with the other audio you've heard, uh, you know, give it a listen. What do you think? Does it sound better? Does it sound worse? You know? Why not? We'll have some fun with it. But anyway, hello, gang. It is your host with the most here with a post-interview update. 
So I am recording this message the day before this interview, or rather this episode, is going to come out. And unfortunately, I have not heard back from Rob about any book recommendations that he may or may not have on the subject of crypto. Now, I did not realize until after we got out of the Zoom call that I actually didn't get his email address. Uh, And he's probably a very busy man who probably just, you know, forgot about me. But such is life. But anyway, let's go ahead and get back to the episode by getting me a copyright strike from YouTube. So... You know, look, there's 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 all kinds of new things that are coming out in this market all the time, right? Look at the NFT, you know, the NFT uh, side of this. You know, a lot of people, in fact, I can't stand the fact they call it NFT because <laughs> because because when you really think about it, what what we're talking about here, let's go back to our whole conversation. What we're talking about here, what NFTs are really talking about is decentralized digital rights management. All of a sudden now, instead of what was the old model, Let, what was the tower? Let's go back. What was the tower model? The tower model was you had a group of broadcasters who owned all of the airwaves. And in order for your television show or your movie to get on the screen or you your song to get on the radio, um, you had to what you had get to, approval, essentially, you got to get approval. And then what else? They had these big recording contracts or a big movie contract. And then there was royalties and Joe got paid this and the movie theaters got paid that. And the, and the actors got paid this. And basically they would collect all that cash in a centralized way and distribute it. We've gone from that model to a world where what podcasts are everywhere. Uh, YouTube, all people are producing video, Instagram, TikTok. All of a sudden, we've got millions and millions of content creators. And why should why should we use a central model for those people to get paid? What if we can embed in the media itself uh, the the uh, the contract, the payment contract? What if I could? Inst- let's say I'm a photographer and I travel all over the world and I want to create my photos and I want to sell my photos. I can embed in that photo the the royalty contract so that says that, okay, when I sell it to you, Alex, in a decentralized world, I get paid. But now, Alex, you own my photo. And all of a sudden, I become Ansel Adams and I'm famous. And now you want to sell the photo that you bought for me for 10 bucks and you want to sell it to somebody else because, I don't know, now it's worth $100,000. Shouldn't I get paid when you sell it later for $100,000? Well, with an NFT type of system, with a with a decentralized digital rights system, now all of a sudden, I could say if you sell it in the future, I get paid ten percent too, or maybe maybe if um, you have a promoter to sell my photo to someone, you might say, okay, I want the promoter to get ten percent, or the auction house to get ten percent. So now what we've got with NFTs is really a technology now to allow all of the content creators in the world to all of a sudden enjoy the royalties in the way that they define them, not the bank, not the recording country, not the broadcaster, the actual content creator can def- define the royalties. Huh. I got I to gotta say, this is the first I'm hearing of NFTs being used like that. But again, I, I'm going to plead ignorance here. All I've been hearing of is, uh, hey, don't you right click save my, my JPEG because I own it. Yeah, look, look, let me tell you, let me tell you, it, it, it again, it's not about the NFT itself. It's not about the thing you're buying. It's the system. It's the system, right? Imagine a world where, and, and by the way, how do you get rid of right click? Well, ultimately, let's let's say I'm Kanye West. And I want to create a, uh, I want to create a song and I want to create a unique version of my song and I want to mint 200 of them. All right. So I mint 200 versions of my song and it's an NFT and I embed in that song a ticket. Okay. Or a right to go see me at any show Mm -hmm. at 50% off. And I embed in that song, um, the ability to buy uh, Yeezy's 350 boosts when they come out at Adidas and nobody else can buy them at cost. So even if I right click and copy that song, 
I still don't get the access to the rights that are embedded in it. Right. So you might get you get to listen, but you don't get all the benefits. That's right. And so what you're going to see as these NFTs, as these as these contracts, as the systems and as this emerges, all of a sudden we're going to start seeing all kinds of things, all kinds of tangibles that are going to be layered into those uh, those contracts, because really what you're getting in an NFT is not the NFT. You're getting the digital rights to that content and all that's embedded in it. Hmm. That sounds like that needs to be a whole nother episode. (laughs) (laughs) But it's, you know, this is what this is what's going to happen. You're going to see all kinds of really. You know, as in every new technology that comes out, you have people look at it and go, wow, man, I can do this with this. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's uh, it's off to the races. Well, it's a new tool, just like with any new thing. New First, tool. you probably have the scammers that are like, "Ooh, how can I use this to pull the wool over somebody and get their right. money? And then you got people who are going, well, hold on. Well, you, sure, that exists. But what if we did it? What if we used it for this or what if we did this and then someone else comes along as, oh, well, what? And it gets expanded and grown. And then it's, right. oh, wow, here's what it this could become. So That's with right. NFTs, it sounds like we're in stage one where we and again, I'm just making this up off the top of my head. Don't think I'm quoting anything from Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> uh, like we're still in the stage where people are like, oh, I can make a quick buck by scamming someone with this. They don't understand what this is. But That's right. As we sort of develop here, there's more and more use cases like the couple that you've described, and then it becomes more and more useful and less and less like a joke. That's right. <laughs> That's it. All righty, Rob. Well, uh, I don't I don't know what's going to go on with NFTs, but I think the future is going to be, I think, I think there's going to be some use cases there. But with all of that said, I think we've sort of hit our time today and we need to start kind of getting out of here. So... Rob, where can my audience go to find out more about you and more about your fund, Cosmo X? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter uh, at Rob Frasca. So you can go out there and, and check me out on Twitter. Our fund is CosmoX.com. You can take a look at the portfolio of the things that we're investing in. We've also got a bunch of different in videos that I did on blockchain, on the fund, on tokenization, all that good stuff. So you can check me out there for sure. Well, all righty. And I'll have all those linked in the description below, including those videos. I'm going to have to go check those out after we're done recording. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, Rob, I got to give you the last question. Now, the last question I never really prepare anyone for, and it's not really so much a question as a statement, but if you had to leave our audience with one sort of mic drop statement, just the last thing you'd like to sort of leave us with, what would that be? I think the 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 last the, the most important thing is is that you got to if this is the single largest value creation event in in our lifetime, if it is, and I I believe it is. I don't have a crystal ball, but I believe it is. Then the question is not should I invest in digital assets? The question is, how could you not? And, you know, when you look at it, a very small allocation as an investor into this space disproportionately creates serious uh, return and diversification. So that's the real thing. You just, you got to, if, if you're not in it, you got to get off zero. You got to do your research, read more about it. It's very, very, very interesting. And if you're in it, make sure that you're, you know, You're doing it in an educated way. (laughs) You're in it to win it, not to get scammed. That's right. (laughs) All righty, Rob. Look, sincerely, thank you again for coming on. I mean, I know I thank all my guests that come on the show, but you especially get some extra thanks because you're probably (laughs) one of the first guests that have come on where it's a subject that I don't know anything about, or maybe not anything, where I know the least amount. And it's more of a learning experience for me than asking people questions where I already know half the answers. So Thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Lots of great information, lots of great links. There's going to be lots of stuff below. I'm going to link that theory from Carnegie Mellon. We've got some books, hopefully. We're going to have all kinds of stuff in the description below. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. And for all of you that are still listening, thank you for listening all the way to the end. Be sure you look in the description below to see all of Rob's links. And while you're doing that, I will see you all next time. <laughs>